can see when he comes to the pulpit is a bunch of pillows. <laughs> and I have to say that Eric um, very smartly gave the sermon. So I would suggest that the ushers come and just collect our offerings and have a short morning service. Yeah, that was perfect. I mean, if I could just repeat that. It is a, a strange sort of text for us to talk about, but it's critical. Awake or asleep, we always have hope in Jesus Christ, in his resurrection and in ours. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope about those who fall asleep, those who die. And, you know, I, I frequently think that one of Satan's greatest plans is to take hope away from us. You know, if, if you have a little child, or if you had a little child, and somebody wanted to hurt your feelings, they wanted to make you really wacko, they might poke your kid in the eye, right? What would you do? What would God do if Satan started poking us? And I would argue that is exactly what he's trying to do when he tries to take away our hope. He wants to make God angry because his children are being hurt. That's you and me. And whether we're awake or we are asleep, we are constantly being badgered by Satan. But we also know that we have this absolutely confident expectation in our Lord. How effective it is to, to strike back at God. But when we are getting badgered by, by Satan and, and we're just about ready to give up hope, you need to remember some of the words that you read in the Bible, like the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good, not for evil, plans to give you a future. And it's an everlasting future. Our culture not just in our society, but around the world. Our, our culture is showing more and more evidence of being without hope, or very little hope. We, at least in this country, have more stuff than most other countries in the world. We've got you know, money, we've got technology, we've got great entertainment, but how much happiness is there? How much contentment is there? How much hope is there that we have this stuff? Stuff breaks down. Stuff doesn't love you back. Stuff doesn't do much good at all permanently. And, you know, I thank God that I was born in this country and that I was raised in this country. And thanks to the service of so many, I'm sure many of you sitting here have served in the armed forces to protect me and everybody else sitting here. So I am grateful to be here. But when I see some of the things happening, I think, oh my goodness, where is the hope? What are we doing with it? So the first thing is to figure out exactly what hope is. And I, I would suggest that we think of it in an acronym. You know, H-O-P-E stands for hanging on with patient expectation. Hope is simply hanging on hanging on with patient expectation. You are truly expecting something great to happen, and you are patiently waiting for it to happen. 
And sometimes that's hard work, especially if you're like me. I'm not a man of great patience. So it's really hard for me to hold on to that. But I'm learning more and more, day by day. St. Paul says, afflicted in every way. But we're not crushed. We're not perplexed. We're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And again, Paul says, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness. I am content with insults. I am content with hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong in you. When I am weak, God becomes stronger and stronger and stronger in me. How many of you enjoy hardships? Come on, be honest. How many of you enjoy terrible times? Yeah, none of us. But how many of us can just sort of take a step back, take a breath, And remember, God loves me. And he is going to carry me through even this. And so, sometimes the most difficult thing to experience, the hardest thing, is death. The the death especially of a loved one. You know, a husband, a wife, a child, a parent. How do you hang on with patient expectation? Where is your hope when that happens? Where our hope is, you know, we are holding on with confident expectation. We are holding on to God's promises for those of us who are alive and for those who are asleep, those who have died. Because God himself is hanging on to us, holding our very lives close to him. He's promised to never leave us. He's promised to never forsake us. He has actually defeated Satan. And he has defeated death. So there's nothing to be afraid of. So, as Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant or I don't want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep, those who die, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We have been given faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for all of us the sacrifice to take away all of our sin so that when we fall asleep, we fall asleep in his arms. When we die, we are there with him. That's what God promised. And according to the Lord's own words, listen to this. On the last day, when when the Lord returns... We who are still alive at the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The the asleep ones will be awakened And they will be called by Jesus to get up, get up, be awake, be alive again. And so we will be fully alive again. And then after that, he says, we who are still alive, those who are still living on this earth when Jesus returns, like If he comes in the next two minutes, that would be all of us. We would hear his voice. We would hear the trumpet call. 
We will be caught up together in the clouds to, to meet the Lord in the air. Remember, the Lord is going to come the same way that he went up to heaven. How many of you... My wife thinks I'm a little whacked out when I say this. I cannot wait to see the Lord just coming down. And I'm sort of hoping that he'll wave. Hi, Phil. Been a while, huh? Yeah. I, that's got to be the coolest thing in the world. And therefore, we are to encourage each other with these words. Asleep or alive makes absolutely no difference. God calls us to be alive again in perfection where death does not exist. So, you know, getting, getting the fact that we are Christians, that, that the Holy Spirit has given us faith, given everything that Jesus has said and done to demonstrate his absolute power over death, there are still so many questions that people have, and I happen to find some answers for all the doubters in the world. Stephen Hawking, everybody know who he is? Pretty smart guy. He said recently, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife, for broken down computers don't work. This is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. Does that give you great comfort? Your computer's going to quit? He's a smart guy. But we have a smarter God who says, this is the message that we've heard from him, and we proclaim it to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the greatness of him who has called you and me out of that darkness to live in his marvelous light. No longer afraid of the dark, because we stand in the perfect and glorious light of our Lord. Now, you may prefer to be a little bit like Shirley MacLaine. Remember her? She was reincarnated so many times, I can't remember the times that I read about it in the inquire while standing at Safeway waiting to pay for my groceries. I came back as a king. No, I came back as a queen. Oh, I came back as somebody else. Oh, I had a bad day and came back as a frog. Which one is it? And don't you get tired of coming back? Jesus explains in the Gospel of John, it is the Spirit, my Holy Spirit, that gives life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life, and it is the spirit who gives you life. The flesh cannot help you at all. The words that I have spoken give you life. Where else are you going to go? I mean, I get, that's what it boils down to. Where else are you going to go? Who has a better deal for you? We get everything for free, including eternal life. The hope is always found in the Bible, the, the written word of God. And it starts with the faith that comes through the word of God, through the Bible, that we can believe in what he says. We believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. And you know, if you think of those who have fallen asleep with Jesus, coming back with Jesus, my grandmother, my mom, my dad, my uncles, 
there's going to be a whole bunch of them coming back. And they're going to be alive, perfectly alive, perfect in every way. The Bible uses the term fallen asleep. And it's a wonderful term. For those who die in Christ, for us, to die is nothing more than falling asleep and getting up again. I don't, this is my story, I don't know what yours is, but um, I used to fall asleep a lot in the car when we were driving someplace. And I would be like way out in the back seat. And I could remember being in the car falling asleep. And then I'd open my eyes and it's morning and I was in my bedroom. How the heck did that happen? And my dad would tell me, I scooped you up and I brought you into the house. And now you're awake. Let's have breakfast. That is falling asleep in the Lord. What will we look like when we rise from the dead? What do you look like now? You're going to look just like that except perfect. And my wife is so happy because she's going to have perfect hair. We are not going to look like zombies walking around to eat somebody. We are not going to look like our arms are falling off. We are going to be perfect as Jesus is perfect. We are going to know him as he has known us. We are going to be like him. Alive forever. Can he do that? Eric mentioned Lazarus. He was talking to Martha, and Lazarus has been dead for four days. And as Martha said, Lord, he stinketh. (laughs) Phil, you stinketh. (laughs) And yet Jesus says, you know, don't worry about it. Lazarus, come on out here. Remember what happened? What? Did he come out? Yeah. And remember, Jesus was in the grave for three days, not four. And he did not stinketh because it says that he suffered no decay. He was perfect. Now, can a man raise himself to life? Hmm. (laughs) I'm sorry. This is such a hoot. So Jesus decides, okay, it's the third day. Here's my father's plan. I'm waking up by myself, by my own authority, by my power, and I'm going to walk out of here to prove to all of these people that I can actually do that. And if I can make myself alive again forever, Guess who I can make alive to live with me forever, too? Because I live, so will you. That's the good news. That's the truth. And I pray that we do encourage other people with that. We we know the story. And there are so many people without hope. Goodness gracious, give them a little bit. Give them a little bit of hope. Tell them God loves them. It's a good place to start. Amen? Amen. 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 And I may the peace of God that passes our understanding keep our hearts and our mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.